All right, so welcome. We are here for Go Writing for Related Service Providers. Very exciting. This is the team. Um, Colette is our Federal Programs Coordinator. I am Jennifer Gleason. Um, and we have Ashley and Julie here with us. And I think Carly is on the road at the moment. Um, but all of us were special education teachers and we all have had the experience of writing IEPs and teaching kids. All right, so we are gonna talk about um, the different rules between kind of the medical model and the school model. Um, we'll talk about consultation, skill gaps, IEP goals and objectives. And then I have a bunch of examples at the end that um, I would just like to talk about. I'd like to kind of get what you think of them and I'll tell you what I think of them. All right, so why are the rules different? So clinical, right? Um, when you're in the school, it's Medicaid, right? Your Department of Health and Human Services. Um, you create an individualized treatment plan or plan of care. You talk about um, services being medically necessary. And in education, it's different. So um, education, we're overseen by the Department of Education and the Office of Special Education Programs. The law we have to follow is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Rather than an individualized treatment plan, we have an edu individualized education plan. And rather than medically necessary, we're looking at services that are required in order for the child to benefit from their special education. So kind of a different language. So IDEA defines special education services as services that are required to assist the child to benefit from general education. Related services are required to assist the child to benefit from their special education. So there's not anything like would benefit from you know, or things like that. Um, we see that sometimes in evaluations or IEPs. Um, it, it, it's not about that. It's not about would benefit from everything in special education is required. Um, it has to be required in order for the child to be eligible. This is just a little visual, just to kind of get an idea of how IDEA works. So um, the big DOE, US DOE, provides funding to Maine and actually Congress, I should have a Congress box over there, but anyway. Um, and then Maine provides funding to all of the SAUs. But in return for that funding, we have to show that we are compliant with IDEA as well as um, Maine regulations, which is MUSER, the Maine Unified Special Education Regulations. And then the state, us, Maine DOE, has to show the US DOE that everybody's in compliance, and then they actually write a report to Congress every year. So yes, you can have this money, but you have to do these things in order to get it. All right. So when we go, we go to um, all of the SAUs in the state. We hit every district every four years. So we're, we're around a lot um, visiting schools and we look at IEPs and we've always had this kind of um, worry about, you know, are we telling people that they have to do this thing and then main care is going to say it's wrong and they're not going to pay, right? And so we've been kind of walking that line, but without really knowing what the main care rules were. So in preparation for this, I reached out to Trista and she gave me this, um, main care 101 and main care 102. So I went and did those things. Um, so what I found out is that main care doesn't look at goals. They only look at 
section six and seven, which are the um, accommodation section and the services section. And I know in those sections, you have to have things written perfectly right down to the letter, um, but they don't look at goals at all. Um, these are links that will take you to different materials that will tell you how you have to write things in services and accommodations in section six and seven. So that's just the really broad kind of why we have to follow the education rules when writing IEPs. I'm uh, gonna do a quick little thing about consultation. So typically consultation is used when a child has learned a skill in a more restrictive setting and you're working on generalizing it out into the um, gen ed maybe. Um, and it has to be tied to a goal. Consultation is always tied to a goal. If you're talking about just, you know, talking to the teacher about possible accommodations or, you know, how's the kid doing and you're not, it's not tied to a specific goal, that's collaboration. And that would go in as an accommodation in section six. Consultation is a service and goes in section seven. So this might be what it looks like. Um, so this is special education teacher providing SDI and an OT providing consultation on a self-regulation goal. So you can have both on one goal. That's absolutely fine because that actually really happens in real life. I know I did this a lot um, with my OT and speech path. We were working on the same goals often. So just make sure everybody is referenced in the goal and everybody is in the service grid. This is an example of that collaboration um, where you would put it in section six as an accommodation, right? The gen ed teacher and the OT are gonna collaborate on accommodations or something. So oh, Carly made this great visual. I want to put it in here. So um, if there's a goal, it goes in section seven. If there's no goal, it goes in section six. Just an easy way to remember that. All right, now, now that I'm here and you can hear me, I'm talking crazy fast, so I'm sorry about that. Any questions on that? Hi, um, this is Catherine. I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, could you, so not for consultation, but just for direct services, could uh, two providers still share a goal? So for example, um, you know, given social work and occupational therapy services, the goal is about self-regulation, for example. Is that possible or is that only okay when you're combining a direct service with consultation? That's a good question. We haven't gotten that question before. I think that would be okay, especially that example that you said, because the social worker is working on, you know, probably some CBT or something, and then the mm -hmm. OT would be working on the sensory stuff, right? That kind of thing. Exactly. And they would each have yeah. their own place in the service grid, of course. Yes. Uh, but they were both on that same goal, because yeah. a lot of times we have, uh, you know, frankly, very similar goals because, you know, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah, to know. I think that makes sense in that, in that situation, you know, it, it obviously every situation is different, but yeah. Okay. I Thank would you. say that's okay. That was a good question. I like getting questions we never heard before. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk a little bit about skill gaps. So this would be section four of the IEP. So when we're talking about functional skills, we're talking about cognitive, communicative, motor, adaptive, social, emotional, and sensory. Those are like the super broad areas of um, functional programming. So we want to really look at what specific skills, like you wouldn't write a goal, student will increase communication skills because there are a lot of skills under that broad area of communication. So you wanna be really, really specific and lay out those really specific skill gaps in section four. 
And of course, you want the distinctly measurable and persistent gaps and how do they affect the child's involvement and progress in the general education curriculum. So this comes back to services are required in order for the, the student to access their education. So you have to, this is kind of explaining that, right? How, how is this gap affecting the student at school? So you're kind of saying why you need these, why the child needs these services. So we have some examples of um, specific gaps and how statements, um, just to kind of give you an idea. Um, let's go, Michael's deficit with grasping items impacts his ability to use writing tools in class, right? Those kind of simple things. All right, so again, very specific with the gaps. Um, you don't wanna reference those broad areas. You do not wanna reference evaluation results or standard scores. You're just listing those specific gaps. So I have some examples here and I'm starting with um, an academic example because it's kind of easier to wrap your head around. Um, so reading, you wouldn't see a goal that said student will read on a fifth grade level if they're in fifth grade and they read at the second grade level, right? You, you just wouldn't. The goals are around the skills. There are a lot of skills that go into learning how to read. And the goals are around those skills. You do eventually, the, the outcome that you're hoping for is that the student will, be re will read at grade level, but in order to get them there, you're teaching them letter ID, decoding, fluency, all of those skills that lend themselves to reading at grade level. So let's bring this to functional. So expressive language, a lot of skills go into expressive language, right? There's articulation, there's grammar, um, speaking fluency, all kinds of things. I'm sure the speech paths can give me more, but that's what your goals are around, those, those skills that you're teaching. We have another one, fine motor, um, grasping, right? That's a skill. Coloring, cutting, these are all different skills within the broader area of fine motor skills. Social skills, it's in the name, right? Social skills, it's plural. Um, so maybe identifying feelings in others, turn-taking, self-regulation, all of these things are important for social skills, and they are the skills that, they are the social skills. Uh, reducing interfering behaviors, right? They may maybe need to be able to identify feelings in themselves, need to learn coping strategies, and then they need to learn how to access those coping strategies when they are feeling dysregulated. So there's a lot of different skills in there that will lend themselves to reducing interfering behaviors. So you really wanna think about that. Your gaps need to be those really, really specific skills. So this is just an example. The evaluations say that the student has a fine motor deficit. Um, so this person decided to work on cutting and coloring. Those are the specific skill gaps. So that's what goes in section 4D. Questions on that? Can I ask Hi. a question? Oh. Yeah. Is someone else going? You can go first. Okay, thank you. Um, on the IEP, um, what I guess I have a question about is the difference between, I'm trying to look at it, um, mm -hmm. area focus and goal label. So that is specific to your vendor. I don't know which system oh, you okay. use. So that's specific to that. It's not on the um, official okay. IEP. So I would ask the special ed director what you should put in those. Okay. So, all right. That perfect. Great. Thank you. So I was just going to ask um, 
kind of more specifically about when we're working on a handwriting goal, there's a lot of elements that go into handwriting. So yeah. would we still, would you still have us separate each, each part of the skill that goes into the handwriting or would that be more of a handwriting goal with objectives around the skills that go into handwriting? Because so, that's where I get hung up on, should I write these as objectives or should they be individual goals, but they're all leading towards this one skill deficit in handwriting? It's just because it's such a complicated um, thing to do, <laughs> right? Right, right. And yes, I get that. Um, so if you can equate that to um, articulation, I'm more of a speech person, my undergrad was in speech and language so I can speak to that more but um, if I can just correlate that with articulation right we don't expect a separate goal for each sound okay when they're doing it so is it something like that when you're talking about the skills that go into handwriting um well there's elements of visual motor skills and fine motor skills precision strength um you know, bilateral coordination, all of right. those things go into being effective in handwriting. Um, but I wouldn't want to make 15 goals all with different target areas because those are the skills I'm working on to get to the handwriting. Okay. The handwriting is your goal because sure. all of those other things are, um, they're not necessarily, they're I don't want to say they're not <laughs> skills. It's yeah. It's more of like, um, like that's that's what goes into handwriting, but they're not yeah. necessarily skills. It's more a matter of like strengthening or um, that kind of a thing. So that's not a skill. It's something you need to work on, mm -hmm. but it's not a skill that you're necessarily teaching. You're doing things to kind of, you know, develop that crossing midline or something yeah. like that. Um but it's not something you're you're teaching the handwriting. Yeah. Does that make sense? So would it be appropriate to put like um, pencil grasp as an objective and then with the overarching goal of handwriting? No. Okay. <laughs> We're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. But, but could you, if you think that the student is going to get the pencil grasp and move on and be able to do some handwriting within one year. That's your goal, right? It's one year. Do the do the thing you can get to in a year. Yeah. Right? You're still working on these things as kind of prerequisite to get to the thing you right. can get to in a year, but the goal is the thing you can get to in a year. Right. And right. then you can address those other things maybe in progress reports or something. Okay. All right. Sense. Thank you. All thank right. you. It, we'll see if if this gets cleared up in the next section or not. I feel like I'm having conversations of things I don't know about. So I, I might ask you a lot of questions back. All right, goals and objectives. So each of those specific skill gaps is gonna get a present level and a goal. So first we're gonna talk a little bit about present level. So this is from the procedural manual and you can get to it with this link at the top um, if you Use the PowerPoint that has a slide on each page, the links will work, but the ones with no space, the links will not work. Um, so anyway, the present le the procedural manual talks about present level is your baseline for that goal, right? For that skill gap. And it's aligned with the goal. Um, so there's alignment from the gap to the present level to the goal and back again. And it needs to be understandable to the whole IEP team, including the parents. So this is where those other skills that we were just talking about kind of come in. Um, parents understand handwriting and that's your goal. So that's what you write. Um, present level of performance is not. So remember, it's baseline data for your goal. So it's not subjective. We see a lot of you know, Tommy struggles with handwriting. Um, we see about sometimes less than 
ranges, approximately all of those things. Um, be confident in your data. If you, if the student is new to you and you have time for a quick probe, that's your baseline data, right? That's where that student is right now. And you're gonna use that baseline data to um, figure out how long, how, where the student can get in one year, right? If you don't have the baseline data, I'm not sure how to get to the goal measurement. Also, present level and goal measurement are not standard scores, percentiles, or multiple skills, right? Remember, we're doing those really specific skill gaps and each gap gets its own goal. I'm gonna talk about standard scores here. So you're using the same data point, right? Your baseline data, your measurement data, and your progress monitoring, that's your data point. So if you're using standard scores, how are you progress monitoring? You're not gonna wait three years until you do another evaluation, right? You need to have data on that really specific skill gap. All right, this next slide is a lot, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I made this just at the last minute today, and I think it's a little busy, but um, so data collection and analysis, right? Your data, if you're taking data all the time and looking at it all the time, the data is gonna show you if the student is making progress or not, right? And if they are not making progress, maybe we need to change what we're doing a little bit. Is it the curriculum? Are they missing some prerequisite skill? Is it the materials? Do you need to use something to get their attention more, right? They like cars, so use cars or whatever. Um, so you're gonna form a hypothesis, right? About why the student isn't getting this and you're gonna change something. Maybe you decide you need to teach a prerequisite skill. Maybe you change the materials you're using, something. Implement that change let it go a little bit, look at the data again. Is the student making progress? If not, you go back and you keep circling around till you get it. And this all really comes back to that um, Andrew F, um, that Andrew F case that went to the Supreme Court um, where the Supreme Court said that kids need to make progress and we need to make our goals um, in such a way as they can be achievable in a year. And we need to keep track of progress and make sure that our students are making progress. Finally, I have an example here. Um, so this is back to that same example, cutting and coloring. So cutting and coloring are our skill gaps that we're working on this year. And you could see there is baseline data in the present level and a goal. There's a goal for cutting, there's a goal for coloring. That first one, the one for cutting, you could see Stanley cuts on a quarter inch straight line with 80% accuracy. That's kind of, that's the prerequisite skill. So then we have the baseline. He cuts a one eighth inch straight line with 20% accuracy. So that first part is really good information to have right, that prerequisite skill. But we also want the baseline for, um, that aligns with the goal, the same data point, right? He's at 20% now, we want him to get to 50%. And that's what we're using for our progress monitoring. And here we're gonna talk about Goals and objectives, and this is why I said no to your question when you asked about that. Um, so goals are annual. They are achievable in one year. They're formulated to address distinctly measurable, distinctly measurable and persistent skill gaps. They need to be measurable. And the measurement is the same data point that you use for progress monitoring. Objectives are short term. They're benchmarks to get to that annual goal. So they're less than one year. Typically, they follow the progress reporting timeline, but don't need to. They are never required for functional goals, but they're always allowed. They also need to be measurable, and the measurement is the same data point you're going to use for progress monitoring. 
All right. Questions before we get to examples. Hello, I have a question. Yes. Um, in that last example with the cutting and coloring student, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you had here, so um, the services were both direct OT services and OT consultation. So yeah. um, I thought that you could only do one at a time, like first you're pulling them into a less restrictive environment. Eventually you want to help generalize that to the classroom through consult with the with the teacher it's like a step down or maintenance yes. service so um you're 100 percent right on that okay so put them both in there you would not typically see <laughs> that okay no okay thank you thank you that was a very good question i like that anything else i have a question yeah um, in our district, we have done in the past where we have one goal in multiple objectives. So this seems like it's a new way of thinking where we are gonna, going to need multiple goals and less objectives for the related services like PT and OT. Is that true? Um, I mean, I would do what does your director have a certain preference of how you write goals? Uh, well, with the new DOE training that we've just started receiving, it seems like it's going to be a shift, less objectives and more goals. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know the special ed teachers have been doing it this way for a long time. I think the related service providers have not. And, and we were thinking that was because of main care but it's not okay um, so main care because i think main care did used to require us to have objectives they might yeah i i don't know but they I don't know they, they, they don't anymore don't. or nope okay it's not in the iep i don't know about mm -hmm. the other documentation i would go to those um links earlier in the slideshow okay. and um see what the main care requirements are okay Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. I have a bunch of goals that I would just like to put up here and just get your thoughts on. Just kind of um, just a discussion. So anybody i'll give you a few minutes but anybody want to jump in with thoughts on this one yep continues to struggle Do we have any social workers here who want to talk about this one? All right, I have a couple of things to say about this one. So social work goals are hard because too much there, yes. <laughs> Definitely too much there. Um, there are things that social workers work on that are really hard to measure. Like if you're doing cognitive behavioral therapy and you're working on negative self-talk, how do you measure that? How do you know if the student is practicing negative self-talk or positive self-talk? You can't dig into their brain, right? Um, practicing mindfulness, how do you know? So I think that social work services are really hard in that sense. Um, so for some kids, you might wanna do a self-report kind of a thing, but if they're not self-aware, that's hard. Um, so if you 
I don't know, if you can think of um, really things that you can measure, things that you can see. If you can see it, you can measure it. Um, so a lot of times we're um, looking at, you know, will use coping skills for self-regulation in, you know, three out of four opportunities. And you could see those opportunities, right? If they have a big meltdown, that was an opportunity that they missed. Um, but there are those other things that you just can't see. And the only thing I have for that is self-report. Um, learn and practice. Um, yep. What else we got? How many coping strategies does the student know? Right, because there's a difference between learning new strategies and utilizing previously learned strategies. Nice. So these are the things that I put in here. No baseline data in the present level. Somebody found that. Multiple skills. People found that. And there's also no measurement data here. But it's hard to put measurement data with that many skills as well. And for the things like practice mindfulness. All right. How about this one? Need present level, need your baseline data. Greater than is a no no. <laughs> yes, Holly, there doesn't appear to be a skill here. And my big question here is. What are appropriate social pragmatic skills? I mean, that might be different for everybody. So the thing that helps to get with the um, skill gap, the thing that helped me, because when I was teaching, I had a lot of goals that said, we'll reduce instances of aggression, but that's not what I was teaching, right? So think about what are you teaching? And that helps you get to the skill. What are you teaching? So what are these appropriate social pragmatic skills? Maintain. Yes. Hoping somebody would see that. Um, it's funny because there's no baseline data here, but then it says maintain appropriate social pragmatic skills at greater than 90%. So it seems like Matilda is already doing that. Um, but it's hard to tell. And it also, this also could be a, um, I mean, it's consultation services, so it could be something we are generalizing out and that would make sense with the maintaining, but appropriate pra social pragmatic skills are um, a little vague. And well, that's a good point. If there's consultation, then there must be baseline data. Yeah. All right, this is, these are the things, oh look, all the things I talked about. What are you measuring, right? What are your appropriate social pragmatic skills? How are you measuring that? That will give you your skills there. All right, ready for another one? Less than, but it's also an approximately in there.
Yep. Separate goals. Those are all distinct skills. What about the goal itself? If you don't look at the objectives and you just look at the goal, what do you see? Severe to moderate is subjective. And I, I'm not sure that this is something I'm hoping you guys could tell me. Is severe to moderate does that come from the evaluations or is it a sub I, I don't know where that comes from. To me, it's very subjective. Um, if it comes from the evaluations, you're not going to get it for another three years. So I'm not, and I don't think the parents would understand that either but we see it often. So I'm just hoping this group could <laughs> fill me in on what severe to moderate means. I'm looking at yours, Susie, the first one. Well, follow one step directions involving prepositions. Um, shows receptive that you understand those prepositions, I think. But they should all be separate goals anyway, that go under the umbrella of receptive language. Because remember, your goals are those benchmarks to get to. So they're the goals are short term, they're not one year long. All right, I'm going to show you what I put on here. Baseline data is unclear. Measurement, I think that measurement is from evaluations. I'm not 100% on it. Multiple skills. The objectives do have clear measurement data. They're really good. Those would be really good individual goals. Um, the objectives aren't short term. I have a shorter one. I'm really working on my wait time. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Where did I go? Oh no, I went backwards, sorry. That's the one we just did. There we go. Yep. Measurement, right? Both baseline and measurement for the goal. You got that, right? Aha, Susie. There we go. Um, so the coping skills, you have to learn the coping skills and then you have to learn how to apply the coping skills. So it is kind of two different things. Um, I think that if, I don't know, maybe the rest of the team can jump in if I'm saying something bad, but I think that if you, at the beginning of the year, if Priscilla, doesn't know any coping skills, but you're sure she can learn some and learn to apply them by the end of the year, I think learn and apply might be okay. It would be a tricky thing. All right, got another one. This one's a long one. 
give it extra wait time. Yeah. <laughs> Very long, isn't it? There's definitely multiple skills in there. And you can tell in the um, present level, it says in the area of this, in the area of that, and then in the area of this. So you kind of giving it away that these are all different skills. No baseline data, right. I would also say things like moderate physical assistance and minimal physical assistance are subjective. All right, let's see what I had on here. The baseline data, multiple skills, the physical assistance, right? Is that understandable to all that moderate, maximal, minimal? physical assistant. All right, I think this next one is the last one. Anybody got anything on this one? You're okay with this one, Holly. Good. Thank you for the positive, Holly. I like some positive in my life. Anybody else okay with this one? Oh, good question. Does coping skills need to be defined? I don't think so, especially here. It's about applying pre-learned coping skills. Um, you can put like including blah, 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 blah. Um, you would definitely want to put in the um, accommodation section any um, tools or time the student might need to use these coping skills, right? If they need a um, fidget or if um, one of the coping skills is to take a short walk, right? Those need to be in the accommodation so that everybody knows to have them available. So I too am okay with this one. The language is understandable. Measurement is clear. Your baseline and your um, goal measurement are both clear. And that's all I have. Instead of max mod min, can we use hand over hand? Yeah. I think that's more understandable. Hand over hand. You could do like a partial physical prompt, maybe. Elbow prompt, something like that might um, work. Yeah, I mean, think just think about will the parent understand this? Is it clear to everyone what we're talking about? And you will be a-okay. All right, any more questions? All 
All right, I am gonna go through the last little bit here. So we have resources. This is the procedural manual that we talked about. You can link to it. MUSER, the Maine Unified Special Education Regulations. This is also a very cool tool. Um, these are all the things that we look at when we come on site and look at IEPs. So it has the code we use. You don't need to know the code, but it has the location and where it is in the IEP. It has the user and IDEA citation there. And then it just has bullets of what, what are we looking for here? What should, what should this part of the IEP have? So this, um, this link will bring you right to that. We call it the quick reference document, but it's like 14 pages long. So shorter than the procedural manual. You can get to our PD calendar here. That second link will bring you to all of our past recordings and PowerPoints. And then we have all kinds of resources, forms, data, anything you wanna see. We're almost at the end of the year. So this is all of the PD we have left for this um, school year. That link at the bottom will bring you to recordings of all of our office hours we've done throughout the year. Um, we're putting together our list for next year. So if you have ideas, if you have things that you would like us to talk about at our office hours, let us know because we're always, we want to do what you need. This link will bring you to a feedback form. This would be a great place to put ideas for future PD, um, but also we do take this. We have changed um, some of what we do based on feedback. And you will also put in your email and you'll get a contact hour just for being here with us. And you could find the main DOE all over the place. And this is our contact information. Feel free to reach out anytime. If you're struggling with goal writing or anything and you want to shoot us an email with a hypothetical, don't send us an IEP um, because federal regulations mandate that if we see something that's non-compliant, we have to not only ask you to correct it, but then we have to ask for evidence of systemic correction and it snowballs into a big nightmare. But if you send us a hypothetical, hypothetically, if I were to write a goal like this, would it be compliant? We are very happy to give you feedback on that anytime. So that is all I have, and thank you very much. All right, you guys have a great week. You're almost there. You're almost at the end of the year. Awesome, thanks for joining us, Eric. Thank you, everyone.